so much for being here today. I know that your options for great sessions are plentiful and I value your time, but that you have just taken the first step in increased student success and engagement at your college. Let's talk about why we do this. Why would instructors share resources they've written, sometimes with the grant money, sometimes without compensation, sharing with colleagues, it's because we are student focused and you're student focused if you're in this room right now. We, our students are involved. I think it's really important to let your students know what open is, not just like, oh, guess what? You don't have to buy a book. Explain to them what it is and why and get them involved because you'll want that student voice. The students planned a thank you party for faculty. We had a nice e-learning, put a nice sign together for them to put their signatures on. And before they could have the second party, we reached two million, so the students are holding up a two. It's not just a peace sign. <laughs> and before we even had a chance to make a new sign, you'll hear in a minute we've surpassed three. So it's been really exciting to see how invested the faculty have been for the student success. Students often tell us things like they are able to pay rent because of not having to purchase expensive textbooks. In just last academic year, we, in a school with around 13,500 FTEs, students saved $1,355,000 in one academic term. And that is what caused us in the program now to surpass 3.5 million. In fall of 2017, we have 120 sections labeled OER. So it looks like that momentum is gonna keep going. It's nice that now our uh, system is allowing the labeling of the classes. But really, saving money is just the first step. It's, there's so much more engagement that goes on. Saving money is what gets media attention, and it's certainly important, but I've learned it's so much bigger than the cost savings. When we ask students, because we do get feedback from them, we do official surveys and unofficial classroom visits, they also started talking about the time savings. And I was interested to hear more about that. So one example is when I was in the classroom, I didn't understand when I put a copy before I went OER, I would put a copy that I bought myself of the textbook in the library for students to be able to check out. And the policy is two hours. And I didn't realize that there was a line, that this is such a big need for our students, that they're waiting in line to get their two hours. So that was taking away from additional time in their life to study. The first slide was a thank you to Dr. Polly Robinson, who's here with us today. One of her students was telling me that traditionally, before the quarter starts, she would have to ask for double shifts at work to be able to afford the textbooks. When, and then she got fortunate that when she was in Dr. Robinson's class, she was in two other OER sections, she didn't have to ask for double shifts, and then talked about how that gave her time to study. And she was able to put that time into her education instead of just paying for the resource that she didn't, didn't, then didn't have time to read. Another one of our, one of our professors, Steve Johns, one of his students talked about how he didn't get behind in class because he couldn't afford the book for three weeks. So he didn't lose that time with his experience. He also was talking about how he feels when he's, not, when he's coming to class without the book in the traditional way, he feels like there's this socioeconomically disabled um, label on him. And that doesn't feel good that he can't bring his book to class. And he was saying he didn't have to do that. And he also, because Steve talked with him about what open is and really was transparent about the design and we involved the students in the design, he used words like how he didn't like that, he liked that we weren't constrained by the textbook, that we just had a lot more options. Don't wanna to get too ahead of ourselves. I'm hoping to be talking about what we find from the research next year, but we're starting to dive into some research and gather some numbers that show the students in the OER sections are more successful. They're reaching benchmarks faster about reaching 15 credits earned, 30 credits earned, moving out of DevEd into college classes and graduating at a faster rate. And I'm hoping I'll be getting to share more about the numbers next year. So let's talk about the tools that you need for this. And luckily you're not gonna have to have Bond's dagger pointed loafers. How many are new to open? I suggest you start at openwall.org. 
there is a co course that you can sign up for, even if you're not a Washington resident, that's facilitated, and you'll get a certificate in the Introduction to Open class. If you're really anxious to dive in as soon as you get home and don't have time to wait for the next class, all of the modules are freely on that website and open, and you can download them, you can customize them, you can use them at your college. I also suggest you start building a team for sustainability. I started this as an adjunct. We didn't have the team we have now. We started as a pilot, but the success was so strong, we have now been able to add on an OER faculty librarian. We start every project as a team, and we share all of our resources and advice. We want you to be able to replicate what we've done. Open is not a secret. So every team member meeting starts with the faculty member around the table, the OER librarian, and we have amazing Canvas support team. That allows this beautiful collaboration and customization to start. And it also has these other hidden bonuses, like we've sometimes had faculty who weren't using Canvas, that once they sit around that table and our Canvas administrators explain some things they can do in an easier way, now they're adopting Canvas. So it's, we still have faculty at Tacoma Community College that don't realize all the support that's available, and these meetings really help us feature so that you reduce faculty fatigue. Going open is a lot of work. It's great to have a team. That being said, you might be sitting there saying, we don't have that kind of budget, we're not there yet. You can dream big, you might be, but you don't have to stop what you're doing and your progress. Again, go into the community. I would suggest go into the community and on the collaborate feature of open, you can ask, you can always go into the community and ask for help and ask questions. And there's a lot of people there with open knowledge and that will reach out to you. Or sometimes they'll ping me and say, hey, can you answer this one? I'm like, okay, that'd be fun. You can also start a project and say, hey, this is a course, or this is a lab assignment that's not out there yet. I don't want to write it by myself. You know, in Oregon, we had a lab manual that was created where the faculty worked together as a team. When I first went open in public speaking, I was working with faculty in New York, Nebraska, a faculty member in Washington, and Texas. This Collaborate feature makes that possible, and uh, they're doing a lot of feedback over in the tent for Commons and Collaborate that they're getting ready to enhance that even more, and they want feedback from you, which is great, on what it's gonna look like, and like, should we post, these are the projects, these are where you start a project, so that's gonna, be watching out, that's gonna grow even more. So how many are new to Commons? So this is like a quick screenshot of what Commons looks like. We have to condense this session, but I want to plug Hack Night. Hack Night is not just for hackers. It started that way. It started for people who, my first instructure con, I didn't even know what LTM meant. <laughs> the hack people know how to create them, <laughs> but we now have instructional designers that are gonna be there. I'm gonna have a whole open table, and if you'd like some one-on-one -on -one time and some more time to talk about what this is like from the beginning because you're new, I'll be there and we can chat. There's also a lot of great guides. This is just a snippet of the first couple. Of, there's a huge list, and all the guides have screenshots and videos and step-by-step -step instructions. So now we're gonna move into some advanced spy training. <laughs> Cue it off and show Bond his latest gadgets and also be fearful that he would break them. We have a responsibility as a community. It's a, Commons is like a which came first, the chicken or the egg. They put it out there for us, but it's not gonna become vibrant unless we share to it. And we have some responsibilities to do that in the correct way. So I'm gonna give you some, a couple of pro tips that I hope you'll join me on. So when you go to the Commons page, the stuff more towards the right side, like documents and files and video, now there's a content preview so that you can see it before you download it. But a full course doesn't have a preview yet. This can especially be a problem if you're at a school that doesn't let you create your own courses. I really admire our e-learning director, Christopher Soren, gives our faculty the option to open as many Canvas shells as they want to. And this has led to a lot of collaboration for committees, for professional development, and I would really encourage you to let faculty have as many shells as they want to. If you don't, it's hard to download. And even if you do, do I really want to keep downloading and then deleting something if I don't like it? So here's what I want to ask you to join me in as you start sharing your courses to Commons. 
This is the view as it would look like now, and import to course or download the whole thing is the only thing you would have available. But you just want to see it first. <laughs> so I've come up with a workaround. When you're in a course, I'm featuring the 200 level political science course that's in Commons, you're, you know where your settings are on the left hand side, then it's a quick click to make that course publicly viewable. You're going to share it, so being publicly viewable is not a problem. Of course, you can also with your institution, because Commons does actually give you the option. I hope you'll share with us as we share with you, but you do have the option to just share with your institution. Then, maybe if, like me, you forgot and didn't put it in the description before you're sharing, you can go back in and edit it. And now it says, hey, here's a link to the publicly viewable version that someone can check it out and preview it without having to wait for the download and then delete it if it's not gonna fit their needs. The other cool pro tip is to watch at the top for your notifications. This is similar to Facebook and Twitter and social media that you'll see notifications from. If you've downloaded something that someone has updated, it will give you a ping, it will tell you what the update was and give you a choice. Do I wanna stay with mine or take the new one? Which is really cool. I would recommend not doing this with a quiz that's already live, there can be some problems there. So I tend to do any updates in between the quarters, but supposedly you're safe even during the quarter as long as it's not like a live quiz. Another pro tip I would say is involve the students early and often. We've used this as an emergency. <laughs> when I first moved to open, it was in the middle of a quarter. I was in an eight week summer quarter, the students were drowning, I couldn't figure out why because the face-to-face -face sessions were going so well. It was a hybrid course. I asked the students, I teach communication, we talk. I'm like, I would like, I handed out a piece of paper, I said, we're gonna do this anonymously. Please let me know what is causing you to stumble. And one brave student said, I don't need to do it anonymously, we can't afford that book. I'm like, oh, okay. So I went to the library, we actually had an OER director that was there as part of a pilot program, and we did a whole building the plane as you fly it thing. Because I went through that experience, I saw how much it can engage the students when you involve them in course creation. The students, what quarters after, a year after that scenario, were still sending me resources saying, hey, this would be good for your class. I'm like, wow, I want to do this again and again. So this is a screenshot from Commons. Ryan Mosher's speech is in there. And another pro tip I want to give you is writing really good descriptions and tags. If you're having problems using the search engine in Commons, it can be because there wasn't a really vibrant description or tag put with it. It's on us to put in those descriptions and tags so something's going to be searchable. So I put kind of the whole story of why this is there. It's an example speech that people can use in a public speaking class. We are seeing from behind Ryan because she is presenting to the town council. She came up with the idea of being engaged instead of giving the final in class, took the situation that she felt was important to the town council. And so I went and filmed her from behind. And then we added captions when we put it into YouTube and now it's shared as a really good example of how to do a live persuasive speech and how she had to pivot from what she would use as her um, visual aids, because you're not allowed to use visual aids in this scenario at the town council. Because I wrote the vibrant description, you can even search plastic bags, because she was given a speech on why we should have a plastic bag ban in our waterfront town, and it, it comes up. So you can search by an instructor's name, you can search by the topic of the class, and of course then you're going to get, like if you put in public speaking, you're going to get multiple classes. But if we make the content more descriptive, the search will be easier. Another thing you can do is, is use tags as a system. Uh, we have a program at Tacoma Community College for students to get diplomas called the High School 21 program. And they're encouraging instructors to put HS21, then they can go in and search HS21 and see all the courses in the system. Another thing to think about is who your audience is. Of course, this is something I do in the public speaking class. When you're sharing the commons, your audience is other professors instead of the student. So I suggest some little add-ons. So for instance, in the political science class, I encourage the teachers to write a letter. Especially in political science, they explain their philosophy, why they chose the readings that they did, and we're really direct about saying, take this and use it and adapt it however you want. 
this is such an amazing thing. People still, even though it has an open license, will sometimes, I'll get an email, can I use this? Is this really okay? Something that I've shared? I'm like, yes, that's why I shared it, and it has an open license. But sometimes it just can comfort the user to know, yes, take it, change it, do whatever you want to do with it, because we're sharing them never with a non-derivative. We just don't believe in that, because we want you to be able to adapt it to your learning objectives. Then you'll see they put a separate link just with the resources. I love the customization. They use like four different pieces of four different books, and we pulled it out so the student doesn't have to worry about the stuff that's not going to be used. That way you may want to just scan the resources instead of having to go all the way through all the modules and see what the readings are per module. A sample syllabus, so you have that as a guide if you want to take some of those pieces that would work with your college. And then what I really love is we're now creating a chart that's really visual and direct, shows you the backwards design. It's really great to have the instructional designer be part of your open team. So that chart has the learning objective, what the reading is, the video, because we want universal design for learning and options for students, and the assessment. And you can see right across the board that all that's represented so we haven't missed a learning objective in the course. This can be very helpful for your audience. And then if you've downloaded it and you want to use it with students, it's really simple to hide or delete that module. So we're not putting it all over the course, you know, in each module where you've got, you know, fatigue and carpal tunnel from deleting those pieces out. I also would ask you to please cite yourself early and often. It may feel strange at first, and your students, Dr. Robinson has asked before, why is this Christy girl all through this course? It's really good to have that conversation with students and explain to them, we hold them to a high standard for plagiarism, and we want them to cite their sources, so why shouldn't we set the example ourselves? And if we've written it, yeah. Let them know, I wrote this for you, or our department got together and collaborated on this. Another reason it can be really helpful is over time you can forget what pieces you wrote and what you didn't. So we had a course where one instructor had it for 10 years, passed it to another instructor who had it 10 years, now they want to go open. They don't remember what came from the publisher. We're really ethical about not retaining things in the open courses that's not legal to retain. They couldn't remember who wrote what, who wrote what or what came from the publisher, so we had to scrap it all. If we cite from the beginning, and you can see who wrote which pieces, then you know you can go forward, and again, it's just really good for the students. So there is also the LTI integration to be able to do this right into Canvas, and we can talk about that more at Hack Night. We have put this into Canvas, again, just a way to reduce faculty fatigue under the more external tools. You get a drop-down for the Open Attribution Builder. If you don't have this yet, it doesn't mean you can't go forward, because it is at open wall. You can still do it at open wall and just copy and paste it onto the page. We just wanted to have it right in there, and I'll show you what it looks like. Don't try to read the words from there, just a great visual, because an open attribution is just the name of the resource, the name of the author, and which license, so you know what you can do with it. And it, the LTI adds a really nice gray line, so it does help the student visually see where the reading stops and the citation starts. And sometimes there's multiple citations on pages where there's a reading, and then the political science instructors wrote some pieces. They cite where the reading came from, and then they cite themselves for writing the wraparound piece in the content page. I also would ask you to please think about accessibility before you put stuff into comments. Now, while this is humorous, and it looks it dated around the initial first Bond movies, I'll tell you, spy agents, I took this picture very recently at a location very close to where you're sitting. We are still not where we need to be. I understand, again, this may be th something that strains your budget, but that is another great way to use the community and the Collaborate tool and reach out to other open partners to help. In my experiences working in addition to the OER, I'm the instructional designer for the course, and what I've seen is that the open things are actually more accessible than what I've been seeing from the publisher. There are stories like David Littman at Pierce College created a lot of math resources, another faculty member created videos to go with those resources, and then another faculty member in California captioned them. So working together as a team, we can all go farther faster, and accessibility really needs to be in the first day conversation. 
there are things that, if we wait until the end, are really not fixable. So it really needs to be at the very beginning of the conversation. So overall, what we're talking about when we go open is really just getting outside the box. Anecdotally, I think the reason that our students are being more successful is because of the customization that we don't get with other products. Really taking a look at the learning objectives and being able to pull out chapters from different sources and fully customizing that to what we need the students to reach without them having to pay for additional chapters they're not gonna use and they don't understand why. And it leads to frustration and it impacts engagement. Bond would not drive the standard car or wear the standard watch or use the standard cufflinks. Hugh would make sure these items were customized to fit the needs and that's what you can do when you go OER with a class. Now before we break for something shaken not stirred, I wanna give you time to ask questions. Thoughts, concerns? I'm gonna repeat the questions for the video. The question, the question is, can we do this just at our institution and share with the institution, not everyone, and yes, you can. You can share just with your institution. I would encourage you to share widely because we are all gonna get farther faster if we move together, but yes, you can. If it's public, your institution can already see it. Does that make sense? If you share it with the, so the question was, can I pick both check boxes, public and institution? If you pick the public, your institution already sees it, so you wouldn't need both. You, so the question is, can my institution, once things tagged and vetted, that's where you would tag it. There is a tag box. There's a tag box and a description box. There's also, so the word vetted was put out there. We often talk here, I will hear the question, is this stuff peer reviewed? What is the quality? That's been a conversation. I would ask you to think about quality in terms of what gets the student to the learning objective, but a lot of the OER resources are peer reviewed, especially the OpenStax stuff coming out of Rice University. And Commons has a peer review option. You have the choice when you share your resource to say, please review my course. And it will show if someone has said they would like a review and it gives you the option to type in a review. And you'll see that if you wanna see an example at Tacoma Community College, Melissa Adams shared the, the library science course and asked for a review and there are reviews there. So that I think would answer your tagging and vetting dilemma. Correct, so the question is, are we replacing traditional textbook from the commons? At Tacoma Community College, we've gone wider. Um, one of, it's really great to have a librarian on the team. So we're using open resources. We always check to see if it's in the commons, but there's stuff that's not in the commons yet because it's on us to share. So we're looking outside the commons. And another anecdote I'll share with you, we had an instructor who decided to go open with his course came to me for a review, asked me to check, make sure if I've done all this correctly. I said, well, there's four PDFs in this course that I don't see wh where they're coming from. There's no citation. It's, it kind of looks like it's copied out of a book you used before. And he said, these are things that I love and I want to keep. So I said, well, let's at least have a conversation and see if we can find something equivalent. But then when we sat down with the OER faculty librarian, our library already had legal access to those resources. We just needed to permalink it then legally from the library instead of having that old scanned PDF, which also made it more accessible because often a scanned PDF is not gonna allow for the tagging that's gonna work with a screen reader. So now we know that we're legal. We know, and so then what we do with that course before we put it into Commons is make a copy of it and the copy that goes into Commons says we use this resource with a citation that we got from our library. Check with your library to see if your library might have access to this resource also. Using 
Correct. We are using a variety of sources to put the courses together that are open or from the library. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> So the question is, how do you handle when an instructors are sharing and some of it's OER and some's not? And that's where I stay in my swim lane. <laughs> I am not uh, an enforcer. I'm not a chair. It's not my job to critique what's going on. My office is more like an ER room that you come <laughs> before quarter and say, whoa, I need something for this, and I try to help you find it legally in an accessible way and in a UDL way, Universal Design for Learning, so that we also try to find a video to match that reading. And we're also now partnering with a vendor called Ally for accessibility that will allow the students to do something like get another version, like an audio version of a, a written document without having to self-identify they have that need. So this and then I promise I give some attention to the other side of the room. So the question is how to make people aware of what's not in comments. And my answer to that is keep asking people to share the comments. Um, as we continue to share what we've put in there, I'm sorry, did I misunderstand? You definitely can do references. That's where I suggest having the citations but then we've been actually linking or embedding the source. So we have the source there. Yes, like when you look at that political science course, it's not just the references. You'll go straight to those resources. Yes. We have a slight pause for the fire alarm. I promise you I'll be at hack night with a table and I'm so excited to get your questions and feel free to reach out to my email and tweet. I apologize. <laughs>